This week for EM and 5, we're going to talk about cyanide toxicity. And let's start off with thinking about how you get it. So the most common cause that we see in the ER, at least, is from house fires, specifically because wool, silk, uh, rubber, polyurethane, when they combust, they create cyanide gas. Other exposures can be more in like industrial accidents, such as uh, it's used for electroplating, photography, fumigation. Uh, we've also historically seen it used in the wars and also in execution chambers. And we say iatrogenically in hospitals, especially when people are exposed to prolonged high doses of sodium nitroprusside. And so you can get it a couple different ways. You can either ingest it, uh, you can actually inhale it, or you can get it in through the skin. And the main thing to think about here is it causes tissue hypoxia, which leads to death. And so the main two organs affected by tissue hypoxia are going to be the heart and the brain. So we're going to see hypotension, bradycardia, asystole, headache, confusion, seizures, uh, agitation, altered mental status. A couple other things. We can see some results in the lung. So you can get some edema, dyspnea, hypoxia, and also the skin tends to have this pinkish hue, and that's because there's high level of venous oxygen in the skin. Now, there aren't a lot of great findings to tell us when a patient has cyanide toxicity, and that makes it difficult. So it's really thinking about if the patient has exposure and then having a high level of suspicion. A couple things that can cue you off, you might see a high lactate, and like really high, like greater than 10. You can see a high ion gap, and also a high venous oxygen level uh, greater than 40. There's also this pathognomonic bitter almond smell, but a very few percentage of the population can actually genetically smell this, so it's not really helpful to us as providers. There actually is an antidote for cyanide toxicity, and there's these three we really have to choose from. So let's just talk quickly about the mechanism. So this is a normal blood, right? We have oxygen in the arterial blood that's bound to the hemoglobin. It gets dropped off into the mitochondria and the tissues, and then the hemoglobin is deoxygenated in the venous blood. So what cyanide does is it actually binds to the cytochrome AA3 on the electron transport chain, and it inhibits oxygen from entering that chain and also just inhibits it from being dropped off. So you end up with oxygen being stuck to the hemoglobin even in the venous circulation. And that means the tissue has no oxygen and results in a lactic acidosis. Now here's the three antidotes that we talked about, nitrites, hydroxylcobalamin, and sodium thiosulfate. Um, and all of these basically work in one of two ways. Either they bind cyanide or they help out this rhodonase enzyme in order to convert the cyanide into compounds that can be easily and harmlessly excreted through the kidneys. Now hydroxylcobalamin is pretty much our first choice, and that's because it has very few side effects, it's easy to use, it actually can help raise blood pressure, which remember in our patients that are hypotensive that can be helpful, and the only main side effect is that it turns the patient's skin and urine red, which might be a little bit alarming if you don't know about it, but if you know to expect it, know that it resolves on its own and it has no other adverse side effects. Uh, that's really pretty much the only side effect for hydroxylcobalamin and is a good choice to use. The other two, uh, nitrites and sodium thiosulfate, usually come together in this antidote kit. The one problem with nitrates is that they're just not the greatest thing to use. They can cause hypotension in an already hypotensive patient, and they can actually cause worsening cellular hypoxia if you have concurrent carbon monoxide toxicity. Now you're thinking, well, what are the chances the patient's going to have both carbon monoxide and cyanide toxicity? Well, remember how we said that patients get cyanide toxicity in fires, right? And that's what can also cause carbon monoxide poisoning. So this is actually a pretty big deal. The reason it causes this problem is because the nitrites first convert into methemoglobin in this pathway, which can cause methemoglobinemia. And a patient that already has hypoxia from cyanide and from carbon monoxide, adding that methemoglobinemia is just too much and it results in further cellular hypoxia. So the key thing to think about if the patient got this from a smoke inhalation or from a fire, do not use nitrites. You can use the sodium thiosulfate on its own, however. So in the pre-hospital setting, make sure that you decon the patients, get their clothes off, irrigate their skin, use appropriate protective equipment, and also remember the pulse ax is not going to be very reliable. So three things to remember for cyanide toxicity, it causes tissue hypoxia, and you might see a high lactate. It's going to be mostly seen in fires or possibly suicide or industrial accidents. And the antidote of choice is going to be hydroxylcobalamin. Make sure that you do not use nitrites if there's smoke toxicity involved, like carbon monoxide toxicity, and you can give thiosulfates on their own. Here's some references, and thanks for joining us on EMN5.